This is Duke University. Okay, we have a very timely topic for our first panel here, the evolution of electric utilities. Now, if you have read any energy sector news in the past year, I'm sure you can't have missed that this is the hot topic right now, the future of electric utilities. Whole conferences are devoted to this topic, so we're certainly not going to get to all the answers here today, despite President Broadhead's wishes. Um, but I do hope that we'll have a chance to dig into some of the trends that are really um, reshaping the way we think about the electric utility business model and have a chance to hear from the utilities themselves about how strategically, from a management perspective, they think about navigating change in this, what is arguably a, a pretty turbulent time um, in an industry that for many decades has been, um, let's say, fairly stable or um, to some extent predictable. So there are lots of forces. We've heard about some of them already today. But just to mention a few, you know, utilities are, are right at the crux of several trends. Um, one is sort of either a declining or flatlining growth in energy demand. And for the first time in many markets, we're seeing an actual sort of decoupling of the energy demand growth rate with economic growth rate, which is new. Um, we're also seeing the new customer demands. We're seeing the tensions that are brought by um, increased growth in the renewable sector, distributed generation, and the questions that arise for how increased distributed generation, um, how the cost should be borne between the utilities and the customers. We're seeing a host of new technologies that are affecting the utility business model, um, as well as increased cyber and physical threats to infrastructure. Um, we're also seeing sort of a change in sort of the generating mix, um, in part by the low natural gas prices, um, and also by the promise of renewables coming online, as well as a very uncertain policy context, um, both for the, the utility policy, the energy policy writ large, and the environmental policies that affect the industry. So I'm sure there are others I've missed, but that's plenty to deal with. Um, each of these has a host of strategic challenges for utilities, um, but we have a great panel of distinguished guests here to talk to some, to talk to some of these issues today. So uh, starting at my immediate left, we have Anne Pramajori, the CEO of ComEd, and then we have Caroline Choi, who's the Senior Vice President of Regulatory Affairs for Southern California Edison, who's come a long way to be with us today. And then we have Rebecca Kiava from Next Era Energy Resources. And they each have uh, quite a different perspective, um, in part because they operate in, in very different markets. So instead of, we're not going to read bios. All of you have those on your YAP or the program. Um, but I would like them to sort of introduce themselves and, and recap a little bit. Just remind us of your utility, the market you operate in, the, the customers you serve. And then and maybe given those different contexts, what, what, which of these issues that are shaping the utility industry are really top of mind for you right now? So if you'd like to start. Sure. Um, good morning. I'm delighted to be here. I uh, come from Chicago, and uh, we are finally have a team in the World Series, so I can tell you that's all people are thinking about in Chicago right now. So I hope there's a few Cubs fans out there. Yeah. the whole game. Yeah, the Stanley Cup may have left town, but uh, Cubs are playing baseball in November, which is unbelievable. But anyway, hello, good morning. Um, so I am uh, I'm at uh, Commonwealth Edison in Chicago. We serve about four million customers. We cover about 11,000 square miles of service territory, northern part of Illinois. We uh, are about 120 years old, so you know, right in the sort of vintage of most of the traditional utilities in the country. And I would say our sort of claim to fame historically is uh, Sam Insel, uh, Thomas Edison's right-hand man, started Commonwealth Edison uh, way back when, and uh, actually designed the business model for the industry designed the regulatory model, the state regulatory model that we all work under. And um, the impetus for that was the fact that he had a, at the time, uh, electric utilities were competitive businesses, um, but the politicians in the city of Chicago 
were actually trying to take a piece of his business, and so he kind of set up the state regulatory model as, uh, as protection. And so 100 and some odd years later, we all work under that. So anyway, just a little piece of history from Chicago, um, very much in keeping with what we understand about Illinois politics. Mm -hmm. So um, what's uh, the, 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 the question uh, that Katie asked, what, you know, what keeps us up at night? What are, what are the big issues that we're dealing with? Um, and I think that uh, the way we think about it is you know, we're looking at total transformation uh, in this industry. I don't think it's anything less than that. In fact, I would say we're really looking at uh, you know, total economic transformation uh, in this country over the next 30, 40 years, driven largely by digitalization. Um, some refer to it as the third industrial revolution. Um, but it is a major game changer. And um, I think that the most challenging part of it for me is that I'm running one business um, in sort of the second industrial revolution economy and trying to envision and design a new business model for the digital world and economy. And that's really the challenge is um, managing both and, uh, and trying to make that migration um, to the new, you know, the new world. And uh, it's, it's pretty monumental, but it's also uh, extremely exciting. And most of the folks that are working on this are delighted to be a part of it. We're attracting talent, um, I think, in the industry like we've never seen, and, and just um, you know glad to glad to be working on it. I think it's it's a tremendous. Um, you know, how many times in your career do you get the chance to see this major technological shift that drives you in the, what is clearly the right social direction, and that is um, decarbonizing the economy. So, Caroline. Well, good morning, and thank you for having me. It was, um, I grew up in North Carolina, so it was a really nice chance to get back to the home state. And, um, and Katie, I know, knew each other. I used to work at Progress, which is now part of Duke Energy, so it was really nice to be back in North Carolina, albeit very briefly. Um, so, you know, in California, the big driver for us right now is carbon, um, what Anne ended up with talking about. And that's, that's really the big policy driver in our state for energy. We just had um, law passed this year that extends the goal of California. So going from 1990 levels in 2020 to 40 percent below 1990 levels by 2030. So it's a very ambitious goal. And if you think about the fact that we're only 14 years away from that in an industry that really does a lot of planning ahead of time, we're, we have this great sense of urgency of what needs to be done in order to accommodate that at the same time that customers are adopting technologies. And so this idea of, um, we talk about it, or I talk about with my team, of managing the present while creating the future. Because we're all having to do both. We're having to manage the expectations of our customers, maintaining that reliable, affordable, um, cleaner energy that our customers are depending on safely while adjusting to the technologies and pace of change that's happening in our industry and in helping to shape that future so that we continue to meet our customers' expectations um, and maintain the service that they rely on. So. Good morning, Rebecca Kiava again. I'm from Nextera Energy, um, and specifically Nextera Energy Resources. Um, Nextera Energy as a whole is a large energy company uh, here in the United States as well as Canada and Spain. We have about 45 gigawatts of power generation roughly split between our two major businesses, Florida Power and Light Company, which is a very large rate regulated, uh, fully integrated utility in the state of Florida, as well as Energy Resources, um, which is the competitive energy supplier that operates outside of the state of Florida. Uh, we are the largest generator of wind and solar energy in the world, um, and it's obviously been a critical part of our business uh, for quite some time now. I would say, you know, in addition to what Anne and Caroline already mentioned in terms of drivers for our industry, um, you know, for us, you know, public policy, while uncertain and always creating opportunity for change, is one of the most certain environments that we've had in quite some time, and specifically about the production tax credit for wind and the investment tax credit for solar, we now have the most visibility that we've had in decades um, in terms of the public policy support uh, for those two critical technologies. So for us, a big challenge on the energy resources side um, is taking advantage of that, capitalizing on what has uh, made wind and solar very competitive as a technology in the United States and making sure that we capitalize on it. Um, the second part, which I'm sure we'll talk about more, is batteries. 
in terms of fundamental change in addition to the digitalization that Anne talked about broadly, uh, batteries have the, the opportunity to fundamentally shift the way that we approach all of our business models, both on the regulated side and on the competitive side. So it's something that we're preparing for um, that we expect to start to happen really in the, the next part of the decade. Well, let's talk a little bit about customers because I think um, we're seeing a really sort of fundamental shift in the way some, at least some customer segments are thinking about wanting to be more actively involved with their energy management. And I think we're also seeing a shift in sort of how utilities view customers, maybe even as far as changing their terminology for, right, from ratepayers to consumers. And so I was wondering if any of you want to comment on sort of that shift and how it's affecting the way you think about your uh, power users um, at your utilities. Start. We we have um, about five and five million uh, meters, so it serves about 14 million customers, 15 million customers, and it's over 50,000 square miles. So we have a real diversity in terms of the geography we serve, from high desert down to the coastal areas, and from very urban to rural ag consumers. Um, we do see a lot of our customers much more interested in their energy usage. Um, but at the same time, you know, the bulk of customers, when you ask them about electricity or their energy provider, they don't think about it, right? So our, our surveys show that most customers think about um, energy like seven minutes a year. So trying to engage them when they think about it seven minutes, yeah, that's generally probably when their lights aren't working, right? So um, probably not the ideal time to talk to them about their power needs. Um, so, but we'll, what we are doing a lot more of is trying to ask customers, how do you want to engage with us? So do you want to hear from us via email? Do you want to know about things via tech? So we're asking their preference so that when we communicate to them about uh, programs or about outages, we're doing it in a way that they want to be communicated to and um, not just the traditional way. And also tr our programs trying to engage our, in our programs, so we have a number of um, demand side management programs, energy efficiency and demand response, and so trying to again market in a way that meets the customer's needs and expectations. Um, and then listening, because we, we have about um, 5,000 customers a month adopting solar, trying to connect to our system. And one of the things that we heard was that it's taking too long. So we went for about 30 days. We looked at our processes, a um, bunch of engineers, and um, very safety conscious, very um, conservative in their thinking. And so our traditional approach was every new rooftop solar project had to go through the process, and, um, and it was a long process. And so it went for about 30 days. We streamlined it to, it's now today, about 1.2 days to interconnect to our system. And that was uh, just by listening to our customers, asking what they wanted, and trying to meet that expectation. So you know, today we have almost 200,000 customers with rooftop solar systems and a residential rooftop solar system. So it's just growing quite rapidly in California. I, I just sort of piggyback on what Caroline said. I think you know we've pretty much trained customers for 100 years not to pay too much attention to what we do in the electric industry unless there's an outage and then, then we hear from them. But I do think that that dynamic is changing. And if you look at um, the trend uh, in, in digitalizing any industry, um, one of the threads is toward customization. Um, if you think about telecommunications and iPhones and the ability to create you know, a, an app sort of platform that is your own when you think about moving from radio, being stuck listening to what was ever on the radio to an iTunes platform. You know, the digital economy is all, all about customization. And so, you know, we have a business that's largely one size fits all. I mean, we have, th you know, three main customer classes, you know, large industrial and commercial, small industrial and commercial and residential. Um, and, uh, and so we've got to think about customers in a much more sophisticated way um, as we move forward, and, and, and they are interested in choice, and as these choices become available and they um, become aware of them, we're going to, um, um, you know, we're going to, we're going to need to be prepared to, to provide that to customers. And, um, you know, it's a challenge. It's a challenge not just in terms of, we talk a lot about the challenge in terms of culture and mindset within the utility, that we don't um, think of our customers in the way that a Procter & Gamble does, where they have you know, five different types of tide and they understand specifically what types of customers or consumers will want those, you know, those, those types of, of um, products. 
Um, and that's certainly one part of it. But the other part of the equation in terms of more granularity, in terms of customer wants and desires is, we have an economic system built up around these utilities that is largely a socialized um, with all sorts of puts and takes in terms of where costs lie and subsidies. And when you start to pull out threads, you start to unravel the whole, whole socialized you know, economic uh, 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 system and structure. And that's one of the things that you know, the policy work that's going on now has to address. And it's a huge, huge uh, question that, that we have to tackle. And when you think about electricity as being a social necessity, as being fundamental to uh, economic equality, uh, when you start to unravel that, there's all sorts of social implications, not just you know, economic and, and indicate, or implications for the industry. So I would add one more to that. It's a little bit of a different um, uh, pull on this thread. It's that we have um, approached, well, let me start with the point of we completed our deployment of smart meters a couple of years ago. So where we before wouldn't know if a customer was out until they called or someone near them called, we now know instantaneously when the customer is out, which is fantastic. But what we also realize with this smart meter deployment, we have the ability to get significant more information about the fabric of the grid than we ever had before. Um, so a couple years ago, we started a project to figure out if we could predict a failure before it occurs based on this information. And so the teams got all of the data uh, for when a failure had occurred and then tried to backcast and figure out what was the secret sauce to predicting before the failure occurred, what was happening in the grid that triggered it. And we've now gotten to the point where we, in certain circumstances, can predict the failure before it occurs. So instead of having to wait for a customer to call, even now in the digital world, um, we now are able to call the customer and tell them something doesn't look right, we need to investigate and help you, partner with you to figure out what the problem is. Um, there was one great example of, of an individual where we did this, where we you know, went and contacted um, this homeowner and indicated that there might be a problem. And he said, listen, I work at home, I can't take time out of my day to figure this, my power's on, I don't have a problem, please stop bothering me. And then not two hours later, he called my powers out. Will you please come back? I'm so sorry. I'm trying to work at home, and now I can't. And it was a problem on the customer side of the house, but we were able to change um, the total interaction with, with the customers in this case. So I think this digitization of our, um, of our product and our service opens up the opportunity for significant interactions that we never had before. So one of the things I think must be most challenging in this environment, and, and maybe this is a question for you, Anne and Rebecca, is how do you make investment decisions when you're talking about generating assets that might have a 50-year life when there's so much uncertainty about the business model and the context in which you'll be operating? So I um, manage the uh, T&D utility. So we, we are restructured in Illinois, so there are no um, generating assets in, in my company. Our sister company, Exelon Generation, um, holds those, and I'll answer the more global question second. But in terms of our investment, um, if you think about transmission and distribution, largely the criteria under which you make investment decisions is pretty simple. It's, is it, you know, does it in, enhance reliability? Is it a capacity issue? Um, is it a safety issue? And then is it least cost? You know, pretty straightforward, it's been that way for 100 years. And as we think about going forward, we're actually trying to redesign our investment model. We're not there yet. Um, but some of the things we think about adding into the equation are, you know, how does it impact carbon or clean? And um, how does it bend the cost curve? So one of the things that we're very concerned about is, as we would expect that the digitalization of the business would drive cost out because that's what we've seen in most transformations. On the T&D side, it's not clear exactly how that happens because essentially what you're doing is you're making the, the, the distribution utility and transmission utility much more sophisticated technically in order to rationalize the supply resources. So trying to figure out exactly how that all calculates is not clear. So one of the questions that we're throwing into our investment model is, does this T&D investment bend the cost curve, and how does it do that? So we've added that into our equation, um, but we're still working on sort of an evolution of this investment model. When I think about Exelon, our parent company globally, and I think about our generation business and our T&D business, 
huge shift going on in our business. And it really goes back to what I said at first, is you're kind of running one business while you're building, developing, envisioning a second business model for the future. And we are the largest holder of nuclear assets, the largest private holder in the world, and the largest in the United States. And these nuclear uh, uh, assets are very much challenged right now economically. And it's very hard to run a nuclear plant. Um, certainly single, um, single unit nuclear plants are, are almost impossible to run given what's happened to power prices, energy prices with natural gas and, and, and renewables coming into the system. So what we're trying to do with those assets is figure out how do you you know, uh, sort of run them for today's world and transition into the new world. And so we're doing a lot of policy work um, along those lines to, you know, hold on to these assets which create, you know, they're, they're zero carbon. Um, they are, they create tremendous uh, economic impact uh, where, they, where they exist, lots of jobs. And, um, but also recognizing that there's a transition uh, to make, um, but how do you manage that? So that's a huge question for our company right now. So, um, Rebecca, you mentioned energy storage. I'm curious uh, to know from all of you whether, what you think are the biggest potential game changers, whether it's technologies or policies that have the sort of promise um, to present new challenges um, and really transform the industry. I'll take a stab at it. I think um, policy and batteries is, is incredibly important. Um, we have some initial installations. You know, we as a company often talk about dipping our toe in the water in new technologies and then growing from there as the business models prove out and the investment um, returns are there as we're expecting. And batteries are, are no different. Um, we have about 50 megawatts of batteries in the Northeast between uh, the PJM markets, Pennsylvania, Jersey, and Maryland roughly, um, and the New England market, and some growing investments in the California market. Um, what we've seen for the investments, particularly in the Northeast, is we need stable public policy in order for those returns ultimately to work out. Um, and then the, the California investments are a little bit different. They're behind the meter, really talking about capacity and, and, um, and peak shaving um, and some reliability benefits. Um, public policy will be really important for batteries. Um, in contrast to some of our other generation um, and transmission and distribution investments, where you have a single mode of value that you can focus on, and maybe it's multimodal, but it's within a fairly tight range of how you think you're gonna deploy this, this technology or this generating capacity. With batteries, what we think will happen is that in long term is that you're really going to get value from four or five or six different streams from that from that investment. Um, perhaps T and D deferrals, perhaps um, fabric down at the distribution level, incremental reliability to some extent, peak shaving to some extent, um, uh, reliability in the sense of when an outage comes out in black start. So in order to be able to get five different value streams, you need to have some way of making sure that it's priced in that way. And I don't know that we've figured that out yet as an industry. I agree that storage is a huge one. Certainly in California, we have a lot of policy already in place to, to support storage. We um, did an all-source local capacity requirement, um, RFO, in, a couple years ago, and we got 260 megawatts of storage, so well over, the, um, well over what we had anticipated. And then we also have a requirement in California for the investor and utilities to go out and acquire a certain amount of storage by 2020. And so for our SCE, it's 580 megawatts of storage that we have to go out and acquire in different buckets. So transmission connected, distribution connected, and behind the meter. And so um, a lot going on in that storage space. And I think particularly as we think about the distributed energy resources that are coming onto our system, storage can be a, a real asset for us to help um, with the the um, solar in particular and wind, but just so these intermittent resources and utilizing storage to help stabilize the system. Um, for for um, peak shaving as well, one of the things that we've just done in California, or for SCE uh, in September, we filed to shift our peak time of use periods to the right. So our peak has been, from 12, has been defined from 12 to 6 for, I don't know, the last 30 years. And we file to shift the peak for our non-residential customers to um, essentially from 4 to 9 p.m. In most cases, it's seasonal. But that's, um, and that's really due to solar coming on the system. And primarily, it's large-scale solar, but even the rooftop solar. And so um, you know, storage can then help with shift, shifting the, the usage for those larger customers. Um, I think also um, public policy, a big one will be it will be carbon. And so certainly we have the Clean Power Plan nationally, but in California it has been the driver for the technology um, 
changes that are occurring, and as well as a lot of the, I mean, obviously markets, we prefer markets wherever possible, but California also has a fair number of complementary policies to help support the goal to get to 40% below 1990 levels. And so it's the storage mandate, it's the 50% renewable portfolio standard that we have in the state. We have energy efficiency mandates. Um, there's a goal to double energy efficiency by 2030. Another issue that we've talked a lot about here at, at Duke, um, especially as we're preparing you know, young leaders to go out and work in the industry, is the important demographic shift that's happening in, in most of the utilities. So by some estimates, we're seeing numbers as high as 30, 40, 50% of executives looking to be retirement eligible in the next five to 10 years in many utilities. So I'm wondering to what extent that's facing your companies and how as an organization you deal with that um, at the same time recognizing not only is this about bringing in new people, but it may be bringing in new skill sets, right? If you're thinking about a utility that looks different in the future. I'll, I'll start. We, so we think a lot about the you know, change in our industry and, and attracting talent and what the skill sets of the future look like. Um, we certainly do have a retirement question, and it's not just in the um, uh, executive or managerial ranks are in our physical workforce as well. We have you know, significant numbers that will be retiring over the next um, you know, three, four, five years. And so how, you know, how do you make sure that you um, develop people for those ranks as well? It takes five you know, to six years to train and develop uh, alignment. Um, so you, know, you need to be thinking ahead and, and be very planful on these sorts of things. Um, but you know, moving away from, from the, the craft skill sets, which we will continue to need, um, you know, we think about, uh, you know, we've really got, you know, again, I go to this running the business we have today and then moving to the business that we're going to have in the future. And, and part of the culture change for us is really trying to drive um, more innovation and, and those sorts of skill sets and cultural foundations into the organization and uh, looking for people who you know, will push the envelope and, and sort of, you know, uh, drive, drive change. And that's a little bit different from, you know, what we've had in the past in utilities and the kind of um, folks that I think we've traditionally uh, attracted with a, uh, you know, more, um, you know, sort of stable status quo kind of business model. Um, so that's been, you know, really, really uh, interesting. We're, um, also trying to think about organizational structure a little bit differently. You know, the sort of lanes of hierarchical control are probably not going to get us where we need to go in the future when you're trying to redesign a business model. So we're, we're um, sort of experimenting with teams and clusters of talent. We have a PhD engineering cluster right now. You know, five or six years ago, I'm not sure that, you know, we would have had a PhD engineer you know, at a utility, and now we have this, you know, little group of about 10 who work together on these just, you know, brilliant ideas. They're going internationally, winning awards, and it's just the excitement is, is incredible to see this sorts of thing. So we're trying to think of talent in terms of, you know, clusters and teams, and, and how can we use that to drive innovation through the, the company versus sort of the traditional hierarchical lane of functionality that, that we've had in, in the organization. Uh, we're doing a lot of the same thing, certainly. Um, I think we're having the same issues in terms of the number of people who are currently eligible for retirement and could leave any day. And so, but also thinking about the kind of skills that we're going to need in the future and that um, digital natives that we talk about today. And so because our grid is becoming more digital and our customers are adopting a digital technology. So even in our traditional roles of the linemen, that they're going to need different skills than they've had in the past. And so working with some of the community colleges that have that curriculum to make sure that as we think about the technologies that are being adopted, how the skills that our linemen are going to need in the field even, and how we communicate with those, with, with them. Um, so looking for talent that's, you know, we think about the convergence that's happening in our industry between communications and um, energy, between transportation and energy, um, or electricity. You know, we're looking for skills now that can help us understand that and, and help us with, with that convergence that's happening. Um, and then, like Commonwealth Edison, we are also trying to break down the 
in the silos. So we've had a very traditional T and D structure, the transmission distribution operations folks, um, customer service folks, and then our you know, sort of A and G folks, you know, HR and law and, and regulatory. And so trying to make sure that we're doing more communications across those, I'm um, having the team set up. So we, we have a grid mod team at the company that has our system planning folks or distribution planning folks as law, it has regulatory, it has customer service. So because we do see that in order to be successful, it is trying to make those bridges across within the company for that understanding to occur. And so that our customer service folks understand what's happening in distribution operations and how um, with an outage, how that communication, if they improve that, it's better serving the customer. So really trying to take a more customer-centric approach to our business and then bringing that to all parts of the company. We see pockets um, across our, both our sides of our company where we, we need to be mindful of it and be thoughtful about transitions. Um, but I gotta tell you, you know, sitting in this room today, I'm not concerned at all. Um, as a Duke undergraduate, there was now you guys can Google this and correct and just you know, tell me if I was just in the wrong place, but I took one class on whether or not global warming was real, and it was in the divinity school. <laughs> um, I know we met there, I don't know if it was actually in the divinity school, but um, it was just not a topic of conversation. And again, maybe I was just in the wrong place at the wrong time, but it was not a place where people thought to start a career or thought that they would work for the rest of their lives. Um, but I think this is a great example of a whole community that's focused on energy and the future of it. Um, there are other communities at other major universities in the country that are similarly focused. And I think that's fantastic. I mean, we've got a great source of talent coming in with new ideas, new approaches, um, exactly at the time that we need it because of the transformation that we're facing in the industry. And I couldn't think of a better place uh, for folks starting out in their careers or going, um, going out into the industry after getting their graduate degree. Uh, I couldn't think of a better industry to go into. Well, sure, of course. And a note to that, um, and I couldn't agree more um, I, with what both of you said. I also think that we, this industry is so critical. I mean, it will dictate our economic prosperity and our social welfare and security in the future. It did in the 20th century, it will in the 21st century. And I think we have an obligation to go out and start to develop talent um, even earlier. And so we think about you know, high schoolers and middle schoolers and how can we get them interested in STEM, you know, particularly in Chicago, where we've had a workforce that's been basically brought up in manufacturing, the steel mills in large part. And how do we shift you know, those skill sets into STEM skills? And so we think a lot about how we get you know, to, to kids and get them excited about this industry so that we've got you know, this talent pool that's you know, ongoing for, for many years. Um, because this transformation is 30 or 40 years in the making. It's not happening overnight. And we need to make sure that we have that talent you know, coming through. It's just too critical. So I think there's that element of it, too, is what are we doing to make sure that we've got you know, the, the bright kids um, you know, coming into this industry in the future. Excellent. Well, I know that all of you have many questions. I have plenty more, but um, we've got two mics, I believe, in the back here, and we're going to ask you all to move to the mics rather than us bringing the mics to you. Why don't we take a couple of questions? Yeah, the, come down to the mic. Yes, you can. Hello, my name is Ashut Trest. I work at NC State University. Um, it's first of all, it's really refreshing to see all women. The panels are all women. This is the first time I've been in an energy conference where I've seen this. Uh, <laughs> so my question goes particularly to uh, Anne and uh, Rebecca. So you both work in companies, uh, um, electric utilities. Well, I see electric utilities. There's two different trends going on. One of them is how you talk about democratization of energy. Uh, a lot of people buying their own solar panels and Internet of Things and going into uh, energy sector. And the, so on the other side where I see all these bigger utility companies going on a buying spree to buy other electric utilities. So just the utilities are getting bigger and bigger. For example, in North Carolina, Duke just bought Progress Energy and Exelon just bought uh, uh, Pepco and Nextera was, in, was trying to buy Hawaii. Um, so what is going on? I mean, <laughs> is this is this 
I mean, is, is there a disconnect that I see, or is this completely different things in terms of business model, operating business model for electric utilities? Does that make sense? Absolutely. I think it's a great question, um, and I do. I could see on the face of it, you might see the the that might be in contrast with one another. I would say for us, in terms of our acquisition strategy or even our internal growth strategy, where we've gotten to be a very large business in, in the last 15 years, is that we believe in this industry there are multiple things that are key to success, but one of the critical ones is scale. Um, to be able to have a big enough portfolio that you can get leverage across, in our case, different parts of the business for the investments that we make. Um, so scale to us is critical to be able to um, provide efficient competitive service to our both our ratepayers, our consumers, consumer customers at Forward Power and Light Company, but also our utility customers and, and industry partners where they're purchasing it from us in the competitive environment. Why would scale be important? Um, obviously leveraging a number of fixed type asset um, things that you would need to, to be in the industry, um, but also leveraged with suppliers. Um, so for our major suppliers, um, of which Siemens is, is a critical one, as is GE, um, you know, we buy so much from them that our relationship and our partnership with them is critical both directions. Um, so we believe that we get competitive pricing, we get access to technology when it becomes available, and that enables us to compete better in the marketplace. Um, so scale is always important. Um, in terms of the impact of distributed generation, I think that's a challenge for us. It's a challenge for us. How do you continue to be relevant? How do you make the cost and value proposition so worth it to customers that they don't want to install um, power? Or you incorporate the, the power that they're able to install and make our fabric, our, our grid systems, that much more powerful, more capable because of it. And I think it's both at the end of the day. Um, so I don't see them in contrast, again, largely because of the scale. But with the, you know, the change in the marketplace, we do need to be flexible. We need to think about our business model. And we need to continue being relevant to our customers. I think um, so my answer would be, I think, similar. So we definitely see efficiencies being driven by bringing you know, multiple distribution utility platforms together for all the reasons that Rebecca uh, indicated. And uh, we also have an operating model that we apply across these utilities. And what we have seen is you know, reliability improvement, customer um, operations improvement, um, financial improvement. We've just been able to create healthy utilities by taking this management model, which is quite complex. and sort of applying it across. Um, so there's, there's improvement, um, value improvement, as well as efficiencies. I think the other reason is for us is we really see the distribution transmission utility as being the platform um, for the business in the future. And we didn't really talk about platform models much. But you're probably, many of you, familiar with the, the concepts that are being discussed in, in New York. And California has a lot of work going on in this realm as well. But this notion that as uh, the supply resources become more distributed and be and sort of less in the control of the industry and more in the control of individual consumers or aggregators, that it really becomes, so, so you've lost control on the supply side. Demand side becomes much more volatile, which was predictable, you know, even up until, you know, five years ago. And so, so where's, where's the hub? Where's the control in the business going to sit? And it's going to be in the distribution utility. That's where you're going to manage the very volatile elements on the supply and demand side. And so I think we view um, you know, the, the, the hub of the industry as being very focused in the distribution utility and sort of the platform model. Not that we own everything, but that we manage the transactions coming across the business through this very sophisticated grid. And so that's part of the strategy, the, you know, the strategic um, impetus for the, um, for the purchase of other distribution utilities. Thank you. And I'll just add on to that, because I, you know, SCE um, has grown pretty s tremendously over the last, say, five years. And the projection is to continue the growth through just the investments that we're making. So initially, the last five or so years, it was really around transmission to bring some of the large scale renewables to the load centers. And so having some very large transmission projects, multi-billion dollar projects that, um, that were 
knock on wood, close to completing. And um, yeah, knock on wood. <laughs> and then, um, but now, as, as Anne just talked about, really the focus is on, is on the distribution system. And you think about the electorate system, and it is the one thing that connects all these homes and businesses. I mean, the only one that could sort of, I think, maybe be analogous would be the road system, where you have the highways to your local you know, state roads to your local roads. But I mean, that grid it connects every home and business pretty much across the country. And so as the more resources get put onto the distribution system, we have to make investments to be able to maintain the reliability, but also to optimize those resources for a reliable system and have the visibility to all those devices that are out there. We look um, today, as I said, we have you know, almost 200,000 customers with solar panels, but we have um, almost as many with um, electric vehicles, and we have customers adopting energy storage, and then any number of customers who are adopting the smart technologies to help manage their demand. And so we think about the future, and this, even in 10 years, we could have one and a half million customers with distributed energy resources out there on, on our system. And so the investments that we're planning to make, our most recent uh, rate case, we, we just um, filed in September, and of the 5.3 billion capital spend that we're um, requesting for 18, 19, and 20, 2.1 billion of that is in the distribution system, and it's around grid modernization to make the system ready and able to meet our customer needs and to be able to have that visibility into the system. Thank you. So we've got just a couple minutes left. I know we've got three folks waiting here. We can try to get all three questions in if you can ask a very succinct question and maybe just direct it to one or two of our panelists. OK, I guess I'll do my best. Uh, uh, as an MBA who's really interested in the renewable energy industry and who's also interested in the utility industry, uh, I'm curious with multiple different perspectives, you know, what are some of the key economic benefits of renewable energy that you see? We've talked a lot about some of the more qualitative benefits, but I'm curious what you perceive from your different perspectives as the economic benefits, and is there one specific challenge that as an MBA I should be keeping my eye on as I move into the industry? Quick stab at that, and I'll try to be brief. That's not my strong suit, but I talk fast. Um, <laughs> Economic benefits are that renewable energy is getting cheaper and cheaper every day. And yes, in part due to public policy continuing to support, but the reality is the technology is getting better every year and the manufacturing processes are getting more efficient. Um, so wind, where it was 50 to $60 a megawatt hour 10, 15 years ago in competitive areas, we now are looking at projects that are good projects that I'm proud to put in front of our investors, our shareholders, and they, some of them start at $15 a megawatt hour. Um, so below the market prices that are prevailing in those marketplaces. So economically, it's there. The technology continues to improve. I think that trajectory is going to continue for the next decade. All right, I wanted to get back to the utility business model. Um, given that, you, you, <laughs> <laughs> give it, with the distribution system as the hub, and um, are you confident that uh, the revenue will be there to sustain the grid uh, in light of the fact that you know the traditional revenue sources are, are declining with declining demand? take a stab at that. Obviously, we think about that all the time. And one of the things that we think about in terms of the business model is how do you move from a model where uh, your revenues are generated by usage, first of all, to a model where it's generated off of services, fees, or uses. And that's a you know, major shift um, for the business. But one of the, you know, some of the things that we're trying to do, we've actually got a piece of legislation right now that um, we're working on. Um, see if we can get anything done with it. It's always a question, but you know, can we take a service like energy efficiency and actually earn on it? So this is a service that customers want. It provides net benefits. Can we earn on it? That sort of becomes a shift. If we find ourselves able to develop this platform model, you know, do we charge transaction fees? Does that, again, come back to sort of help offset revenue requirement? And so can we find these other streams of revenue um, you know, another thought that we have is, you know, is there infrastructure convergence here? We're doing a pilot right now where we're um, looking to see if we can read um, water meters off of our AMI system so that we should create net efficiencies, but also charge a fee 
that sort of comes outside the bill but can use to be offset revenue requirements. So those are all sorts of things that we're experimenting with right now, but I think that's you know, a huge question in the model, not answered yet, but obviously a, a big, you know, big item on the list. And I think it's so dependent on where you sit and the kind of market you have, right? So in California, where we have a deregulated generation market, and of course, transmission is deregulated, sort of with competitive transmission with four quarter 1,000, um, and a public policy that's really driving um, more use of distributed energy resources. So we have a number of pilots, and I think that's the one thing that, that the industry is doing more of, is piloting ideas and seeing what works. Um, and so we're doing a number of pilots around distributed energy resources for different uses. Can it offset transmission? Can it be a distribution asset? Can it, can it defer generation? And so in each of those different use cases, what does it take to defer transmission or generation or distribution? And what are the services, the other <coughs> services that it can provide? Um, and, and, and certainly pricing is going to have to change. And so the regulatory model um, and the regulatory process likely is going to have to change in order to really meet the pace of changes that are occurring in our industry and the customization that customers are seeking. Okay, well, we, can, we have time for one more very quick question. Yes. Uh, hi, my name is um, Tom Velvisio, and I work with Duke Energy on uh, energy efficiency project development. So thanks for your being bullish on energy efficiency. That's a great thing. Um, my quick question is, you had all been talking or sort of hinting at your vision for the new model you're developing in your head while you're working with the old one in terms of the utility model. Um, if you had to paint a very quick picture, 50, down, 50 years down the road in the career cycle for these students who are here in this room, what do you see as the utility of the future or the electric system of the future? And maybe one quick barrier to that. Very quick picture. Do you want to start? That's big. That's really big. I don't know if that lends itself to a quick answer. That's one of those 5 p.m. we got it all solved kind of, kind of responses. Um, yeah, with beer would be even better. Um, I don't know that the, it's easy to articulate what's going to be 50 years from now. And I think a couple of our speakers, uh, not only our panel, but the prior speakers talked about the fact that so much has changed in a short amount of time, and that almost is the, the status quo for the industry. I think it's much more relevant for us to think about what is it in the next 5, 10, and 15 years is the farthest out that we could think about. Um, I think our success as an industry and then individual companies within it um, to adapting to these changes is really going to define what happens. And so I don't know that we can predict it yet. Um, I think the trends are, are really there that customers want more control in certain cases. They certainly want to have access or have it um, provided to them seamlessly. Um, and distributed is likely a trend that will continue. Um, I think one of the ways that gets really brought together is the success of batteries. And that still needs to come. I mean, we see a trajectory where it becomes relevant in five to 10 years, but that has to happen, or I don't think it really is relevant to customers. It's great to install solar panels on your rooftop, but you're not going to stop getting services from T&D and the generation they provide unless you've got a tremendously powerful battery that can you know, go past a long period of time to get you through um, interruptions. And it's not there yet. So that is an important um, part of, of that uh, vision. I'll take a stab. Um, so I think it's clean. It's pretty obvious. It's lean, meaning less usage. Um, it's resilient as well as reliable. And we didn't talk about resiliency much, but we're looking at climate change, volatile weather. We're looking at security threats. We're going to have a very interconnected grid, but it's also going to be modular. You're going to want to pull pieces apart in the event of a cyber attack or a, a hurricane. And so can I pull off in microgrids or small type of nano grids, critical functions, critical infrastructure, water pumping stations, uh, healthcare campuses, first responder campuses. So interconnected, modular, resilient. On the social side, communal. Um, digital trends have driven you know, more communal, less exclusive. Um, so how can you create community around what we're doing? Communal, connected, customized, we talked about. Um, the principal tenets of the industry, accessibility and affordability, uh, are, are, are part of it. And, um, and I think, um, you know, democratized. So no longer does the industry control from back end to front end, um, but pieces of it are in the hands of many different players. Um, so that's, that's kind of my, my list. Excellent. Well, I... I'll let it go. All right. <laughs> we're keeping you all from a short break. Um, so after this, we're going to have about 10 minutes for another cup of coffee. 
take a quick break and we'll be right back here. I know this is a huge topic. There's a lot to discuss. There's lots to think about. Hopefully you'll have a chance to engage with our panelists as well as we have many other uh, utility executives in the room here today. Thank you again. Thank you.